Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Erin Cristobal. I'm the assistant curator here at The Hammer. Um, and I co-curated the show with Connie Butler. Um, so I'll be introducing the second panel of the afternoon, Voices in Dialogue, Time Travelers. In this panel, art historians compare interpretations of the effect of the times on Adrian Piper's work. Um, we'll have two panelists for this panel. Alex Albero is a professor of art history at Columbia who focuses on first-generation conceptual art, and Nissan Shaked, who is an associate professor of art history at Cal State Long Beach, and is also an, arth an author in the reader that we have that is alongside the catalog of the exhibition, whose essay focused on Piper's work of the 1960s. So I'll have both of them come up. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. And my slides will be appearing now. So beginning in August of 1970, Adrian Piper executed a fairly well-known series of unannounced actions in New York City that she called catalysis. The artist moved through public and private spaces, including streets, subways, buses, bookstores, department stores, and museums, confronting unsuspecting passers-by, while conspicuously having stuffed her mouth with a towel, parts of it protruding, or wearing odorous clothing or substances on her body, or with balloons bulging from various parts of her frame under her attire, or carrying a wet paint sign over a shirt soaked in sticky white enamel, or blowing large bubbles of gum and allowing the gooey substance to adhere to her face and hair. The street actions were obviously meant to provoke Piper's unwitting audience and have been interpreted as a crucial link between the artist's conceptual work and her later, more political interventions that address race and gender objectification, passive and active transactions, otherness, identity, and xenophobia. Piper herself has, on several occasions, attributed the shift in her work, which would soon lead to her mythic being performances, for which she wore mirrored sunglasses, a fake mustache, an Afro wig, and chewed on a cigar from the corner of her mouth as she cruised white women or mugged a young white man, Piper has attributed this development in her work to the social realities that promoted her growing political awareness and engagement in the early 1970s. Already in 1973, she recalled that in the spring of 1970, a number of events occurred that changed everything for me. One, the invasion of Cambodia. Two, the women's movement. Three, Kent State and Jackson State. And four, the closing of City College of New York, where I was in my first term as a philosophy major due to the student rebellion. By her own account, these events profoundly affected her life. And as a result, she says, quote, I did a lot of thinking about my position as an artist, as a woman, and as a black. But I'll argue in what follows, while the impact of these social realities on Piper's work is unquestionable, the spatial relations that characterize the catalysis actions or the mythic being performances were also very much in line with the development of her more figuratively abstract conceptual art of the late 1960s that used classification techniques such as grids, serial sequences, and arrangements of words sometimes as instructions for action, as a medium. It would, in short, be a mistake to attribute the turn in Piper's art in the early 1970s solely to the highly charged political events of the period, since that work evolves in many ways logically from the notion of space as a medium that she had already begun to work with in the late 1970s. I'm sorry, in the late 1960s. <clears throat> 
Now, Piper's early conceptual artwork, which she began to make in 1967, explored things, words, sounds, pages, paper, as concrete physical objects that referred both to themselves and also outward to the world of abstract symbolic meaning. By 1968, she had recognized the parallels between her work and that of Saul LeWitt, which beginning in the, late, in the mid to late 1960s, gave primacy to the concept. For LeWitt, all decisions about execution were made in advance. The idea he writes in paragraphs on conceptual art of 1967 functions like a machine that makes the art a logical operation of predetermined rules for decision-making that eliminates the arbitrary, capricious, and the subjective as much as possible. While largely rejecting the importance her older peer placed on the perceptual presentation of the end product and its value in relation to the intellectual process that orders sensory impressions into cognitive categories, Piper found that LeWitt's notion of conceptual art generally tended to corroborate and strengthen her own. This was especially true of his emphasis on the prominence of the conceptual aspect of the creative process. For the kinds of interests she was developing, it was essential that the generative concept be fully developed before she produced the actual piece. Her primary concern became the construction of finite systems which she defined as systems that serve to contain an idea with certain formal limits and to exhaust the possibilities of the idea set by those limits. This, she believed, was the best way to prevent the potentialities of a concept from extending into infinity and thereby presenting her with the conflicting choices of either attempting to satisfy her curiosity about the notion by pursuing it for an indefinite amount of time, or else ignoring the infinite aspect of the thought completely. The difficulty soon emerged of having to decide at just what point a potential permutation was part of the original concept, and when it became another complete idea, with its own separate set of possibilities. Piper tried to resolve that problem by putting aside new ideas for later investigations. Mindful of the gulf between concepts and their manifestation in media such as drawing and photography, for instance, the final system emerged as a result of the drawings in which she attempted to reduce the characteristics of the physical form to those that were most truthful to the evolved thought. In the crystallization of the art idea, Piper sought to discern and use the form that most revealed the notion. But she evidently recognized that there were a number of elements that entered into the production process over which she had little to no control. The spectator, or reader as the case may be, had various options upon encountering her work. One was to refuse to consider the assembled system in its entirety, thereby rejecting perceptual, not to mention conceptual information altogether. Another was to acknowledge the logic that underpinned and in turn generated the piece, while making no effort to infer from it. Yet another option was to grasp, to figure out the operation of the system, but to derive from it a highly idiosyncratic set of implications. In the first and second instances, there was little that Piper could do other than to accept the validity of those responses. Although, judging from what she writes in her extensive texts, she wasn't pleased to see her artwork reduced to such a flat level, the artist came to accept this result in an objective way. After all, everybody sees things differently, and clearly it was impossible for her to impose her own subjective perspective on her work on anybody, let alone everybody else. Piper seems to have found the third type of response to be the most valuable and desirable. For one thing, it generated many new ideas for which she had only to find a more concisely realizable form than the existing one. For another, it broadened her naturally subjective perception. 
and in the combination of two or more personal visions, she found a greater critical objectivity, which she attempted to retain about her work and general development as a whole. Her early conceptual art mobilized descriptive or representational formats, such as grids and maps and linguistic patterns and serial sequences, in order to integrate abstract concepts in space into a logical system of order. These techniques were used as what art historian Helmut Draxler describes as matrices to represent space, as placements, or rather as spatial and temporal concretizations of the subjective, the momentary, or the punctual in general, the matrices function as a priori coordinate systems. Thus, for example, a collage of a map work, such as Utah Manhattan Transfer Number 1 and 2 of 1968, doesn't just expand the horizon by exchanging a one-inch square field from a cropped map of a top-secret US military site in Utah with one of a comparable size of a subway map in Manhattan, it also calls into question the very operation of abstract classification tools, such as cartographic diagrams and graphs and maps and grids, descriptions or representations of space, including, in this case, the physical military site, the subway route, the empty Utah desert, and the relatively dense New York City borough of Manhattan, which now all seem to converge. Space, in the understanding of artworks such as Utah Manhattan Transfer, number one and number two, is encountered not ontologically related to what exists, but conceptually and epistemologically as a, as a particular way of seeing and knowing the world. By early 1969, Piper had come to describe her conceptual art as, quote, involved with using the boundaries of specific elements of time and or space as limitations on the infinite number of possible permutations of these elements. In, uh, so let's try this again. Uh, as limitations on the infinite number of possible permutations of these elements implied by the structure of the language used to identify them. She considered the potentialities of abstract symbolic formats, such as language and other descriptive and representational techniques, to be much greater than those of human perceptual faculties when it came to conveying the inherent character of an area in space. She had evidently realized that these formats, or matrices, generate an enormous amount of information about space, and concluded that it was perfectly logical to allow the specificity, the particular limits of elements she had chosen to work with to define the amount of information presented. That same year, 1969, Piper wrote what seems in retrospect to be a crucial manifesto-like text. Titled Idea, Form, Context, the document proposes three central premises. One, that good ideas are necessary and sufficient for good art. Two, that artistic form is separate from, but necessary for, the realization of an idea in art. And three, that context, generally understood as referring to spatial and temporal factors, is separate from, but necessary for, presenting a realized idea. From these premises, Piper concludes that both form and context are fundamental but not sufficient for the production of art. What's crucial in art is the underlying idea. Yet she continues, quote, the relative importance of form and context in an idea are factors by which the general nature of certain ideas may be determined. When form is important and context unimportant, as in the case of, for instance, the recent work of Donald Judd and Eva Hesse, the idea is generally formal in nature. When, by contrast, both form and context are important, the nature of the idea is generally environmental. And she cites Steve Reich's Pendulum Music and Robert Smithson's Asphalt Rundown, both from 1969, as examples of what she means here. In cases where both form and context are unimportant, she continues, quote, the idea is generally conceptual, and as in Lewitt's 46 three-part variations 
on three different kinds of cubes of 1967, which Piper has repeatedly acknowledged as having had a very important effect on her understanding of art's possibilities at this juncture. But, she explains, when form is unimportant and context important, the idea is generally ideal in nature. And this equation is the one that relates most closely, not only to the late 1960s art of Vito Acconci, she cites the piece Points Blanks of 1969 as an example, and I'll get to that in a moment. But this equation is the one that, in her mind, relates most closely to her work. And here she directs the reader to her area of relocation number two of 1969. Now, Aconchi's points blanks is one of a group of works that the artist made in 1969 that involved a predetermined task executed at regular intervals across a context of time and space. In this case, Aconchi, as of uh, Aconchi on June 13, 1969, called the Paula Cooper Gallery during an opening that day of a group show that included his work called the Paula Cooper Gallery every 10 minutes from public telephones located in New York City as he made his way from the Upper West Side of Manhattan to the gallery's storefront location just south of Houston Street. At the start of the program at 7.31 p.m., a conchi called from Broadway and 100th Street. At 7.42 p.m., he called from Broadway and 90th Street. At 7.51 p.m., he called from Broadway and 84th Street, and so on, until he reached the gallery in Soho at 9.51 p.m., about four minutes after the end of the vernissage, as the audience was beginning to disperse. Over the two hours and 15 minutes of the piece, the artist goes from functioning as a peripheral figure relative to the, to the art public at the opening to representing the center point, the focal point of the work. While the program unfolded, the phone could be heard ringing in the gallery, and every call that Akanchi made was followed by a public announcement with the locations of his phone calls marked on a map of Manhattan. As such, the work accentuates a descriptive approach to space, insofar as Akanchi was not especially interested in the unique attributes of the specific spaces that he moved through, nor with the kinds of social forces involved in the construction of those spaces, but with their logistics at, a particular, at particular moments in time that he then related to the gallery so that someone there could register his coordinates on a topographical map. Piper's area relocation number two catalyzes similar notions of space. The artwork consists of an advertisement in a newspaper, The Village Voice, which relocated the area or space of the advert from the publication's headquarters to the address of the reader. The piece was similar in kind to another work in Piper's area re relocation series in which the artist sent postcards to 170 readers of the magazine Zero to Nine in the summer of 1969, directing them to her untitled grid project in the latest issue of the journal and designating the blank side of each card as an enlargement of one rectangle on the grid relocated to the recipient's address. Both pieces mobilized abstract representational space to indexically relate the two-dimensional space of the printed medium with no volume at all to the reader's address, which should be distinguished from the actual physical or material location of his or her residence. As Piper subsequently explained about these artworks, in fact, it's not possible to physically relocate an area at all when we refer to an area in commonplace parlance, for example, the area of a playing field or a chessboard, we're actually not referring to areas in the strict sense, but rather to three-dimensional physical objects. So in its ideationality, works such as the area relocation pieces address a geometrical reality that's essentially abstract and conceptual, close quote. In other words, the relocations that are central to these works can only be accomplished ideationally in the reader's and art spectator's mind. Piper would soon materialize the concept of space in her artwork. Her hypothesis project, for instance, which she, be, which she began 
in late 1968 and developed over the next year and a half, folded her pure conceptual art investigations that abstracted space and time onto a study of her body as a concrete entity that could refer to itself as well as to other physical objects. The works in the series, especially the 19 sub subtitled uh, situations, employ charts, diagrams, graphs, photographs, and text to explore the particularities of the artist's perspective on the surrounding world, centering on her body as an object that moves through the context of space and time, just like any other. As art historian John Bowles explains, Piper's figured, Piper's figured in the series as a hypothesis whose presence is uncertain. She alternates between positions of object and subject, seeking reassurance for, for her existence in the sequence of photograph moment. moments. Each set of photographs and the hypothesis series as a whole sets out to anchor the artist's intellectual and bodily coherence. But in seeking coherence, the hypothesis project also recognizes that unlike other three-dimensional objects, the human body, and in this case the artists, has a particular capacity, namely a subjective or phenomenological perception of the space through which it moves. The works in the hypothesis project seek to represent and communicate that consciousness indexically by means of photographs and symbolically through textual explanations, inventories of objects, charts, graphs, and coordinate grids. Accordingly, the project documents the artist's experience and her consciousness of that experience in space and at specific time intervals as the material feature that distinguishes her from other objects in the world. To make the works that comprise the hypothesis situations, Piper established a temporal, a spatial and temporal scheme that took photographs of whatever came into her camera viewfinder at particular moments. Sometimes she used measured and predetermined time intervals while at others, she arbitrarily snapped the shutter. So for instance, one cycle in the series, hypothesis situation number 10, depicts shots of a television every 10 seconds during an advertisement for a common painkiller. Another hypothesis situation number 15 documents the furnishings in her apartment. And yet another hypothesis situation number six images steps in the process as she makes her way from her apartment on Hester Street to a nearby grocery store in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Piper then plotted those spaces and moments of domesticity and routine on grids that functioned as space-time coordinate systems. The vertical graphs correlate space while the horizontal ones integrate time. The photographs thus connect each instant with a particular space-time intersection. The subject matter of the work became an account of the artist's phenomenological experience in space and time. Piper fixed her spatial relationship to the objects around her when she, for instance, snapped the camera's shutter, and the overall impression is of her scan of the surrounding space at a given moment in time, suggesting what Bowles describes as her subjective presence in the work through the reversal of her perspective. Each individual element of the scheme indexically or symbolically represents the contents of the artist's consciousness at a particular space-time location and juncture. This is what Piper concluded was the difference between humans and inanimate objects. The latter, inanimate objects, can be located in space relative to other things existing in their relation to each other, but only humans can relate to space and to things in space in a conscious and self-conscious way. That is, only humans are only subjects. I'm sorry, that is, only humans are also subjects. But insofar as Piper subsequently altered the chronological order of some of the photographs in the Hypothesis series, randomly rearranging them and thereby shifting the artwork's representational reality, she set this project in relation to others in the area relocation series, or the Utah Manhattan transfer number one and number two, which, as I've just shown, jumble the descriptive or representational spaces of cartographic maps to give priority to the artist's personal conceptions of them. 
The hypothesis project, in other words, at once pushed toward the development of a phenomenological and social concept of space, only to be pulled back to a conceptual or representational model of space when the artist abstracted the process by rearranging the temporal sequence of the unfolding experience. The full-fledged move into a relational concept of space, which could theorize space only phenomenal, not only phenomenologically, but also performatively as a medium of social relations, would be developed in the catalysis series that Piper began to work on soon after the completion of the hypothesis project in 1970, and further extended in the mythic being performances of a few years later. It's these preconceived street actions, in, in these preconceived street actions, the artist's body, first in the phenomenological perception of what she described as a spatial temporally immediate object, and soon in the psychogeographic and relational logic of interaction in a developing sense of self, functioned as a catalyst to bring into focus, and in her words, to promote a change in the social spaces through which it moved. Humans, Piper's work now seemed to suggest, by producing space according to their own social, psychic, and interactive nature, materialize society into distinctive forms. But these forms, in turn, work to reproduce the subject. A given spatial order is internalized by individuals who comprise it. It imposes its rhythms and geographies on bodies and psyches of the people who are subjectified by it. Yet space, from this perspective, like social contexts as a whole, is performative, always unfinished and open, made and remade on a daily basis, and therefore there can be no assumption of a pre-given pre coherence of spaces or of the subject positions they produce. For identities, like the spaces and orders that catalyze them, are inherently precarious and rather than static, are always in process, are always changing. Social encounters destabilize individual difference and particularity and place emphasis instead on the relationship between people. Moreover, different individuals or social groups are placed in a very distinct ways in relation to space. The degree to which one can move through it, whether walking about the streets or venturing beyond one's own social circle or purview, is restricted by prevailing relations and conventions. These conceptualizations remain implicit. Subjects intuitively know their place and what they can do where. This process, this point concerns not merely the issue of who moves and who doesn't, although that's an important element of it. It also concerns what geographer Doreen Massey refers to as the power in relation to the flows of movement. Some people in society, largely due to the visible aspects of their identity, whether racial, gender, class, or sexuality-based, are more in charge of the movement through social space than others. Some are empowered to initiate flows and movement. Others are not. Some are more on the receiving end of it than others. Some are effectively imprisoned by it. Piper's works of the early 1970s, then, emphasize that, among other things, processes of highly complex social differentiations occur within the context of social space. While humans experience the world through and in space, which is a crucial medium in the production and development of subjectivity and identity, spaces are also socially constructed, and those constructions are founded on acts of exclusion, often in contexts of unequal power relations and relations of domination and exploitation. There are differences in the degree of movement and communication, but also in that of control and initiation. Yet to recognize that space, like identity, is essentially social and constantly struggled over and reimagined in practical ways is to understand it not as a natural, secure, ontological thing rooted in notions of closure, boundedness, and permanence, but as the product of interrelations, as constituted through interactions, and therefore as always under construction, always in the process of being made by the human beings that constitute it. In short, 
To say that something is constructed by human forces is to say that it's within human power to change it, which is, I think, in the end, one of the most important insights generated by Adrian Piper's conceptually derived artistic practice. Thank you. everybody. Um, oh, it's hard to see. Uh, so this is going to be interesting because some uh, similar quotes and similar works and different, um, it's interesting comparative day today. Um, so uh, I want to thank uh, Connie and Aaron for the invitation and Claudia um, and Annie Philbin for being Annie Philbin. Um, and I'm going to start with these works. So um, uh, same works uh, from Adrian Piper's Oeuvre that have been so widely circulated that they have become iconic of her practice. You see her, so, you know, these are the works that everybody looks at and everybody analyzes. You see her riding the subway with a towel stuffed in her mouth till her face bulges and walking the streets of New York City wearing a white shirt painted in white with a sign saying wet paint, prompting curious looks for passer from passers-by. There's some excellent interpretations out there that analyzes that analyze the images and the actions um, that these photographs stand for, because there's so many meanings to derive, obviously. Uh, but the curious bit about these few photographs, which were taken by Piper's friend and interlocutor Rosemary Meyer, uh, from this morning's very interesting talk, is that in fact they represent a tiny fraction from an immense series. The other intriguing thing about this series is that the vast majority of it is in fact invisible. So rather than starting with the image in order to get to the work's significance and meaning, I want to approach it through the moments of the work's reception. Finding meaning where the work meets its audience rather than its conception or birth is, as Rosalind Krauss identified, characteristic of Marcel Duchamp's attitude. It is also characteristics, characteristic of so many 1960s artists influenced by Marcel Duchamp. The dematerialty of Piper's work, uh, to use Lucy Lepard and John Chandler's term, would be understood within the broad framework of late 60s conceptualism, where the work's invisibility was strategy and means to enact a philosophical inquiry. The significance of Piper's contribution to conceptualism is in elaborating upon the universalist investigations of conceptual art with a capital C, to form a synthetic conceptualism where particular case studies are used as models from which to abstract broad principles. This was configured as both homage to conceptual art with a capital C, and a critique of the universalist assumptions made by the artists. It declared the impossibility of purely abstract universalism and instead shifted the trajectory of the proposition to commence with living phenomena and then move towards abstraction rather than start with abstraction and then there's this kind of latent idealism implied in it. So it was a philosophical intervention. It had artistic application that had political implication. To make invisible work was to take a stance on art's dependency upon institutional context for verification and meaning. A withdrawal from the assumption that art is an object validated through the market and our museum display. To this end, Piper took the most immediate path, exploiting her body as an art object. This placed on display the ways in which Piper as subject and her body as object were gendered, raced, classed, age determined, etc. So these were not autobiographical narrative gestures, but rather a clarification on how universal proposition actually function and how they should be understood. As such, this work offers a framework for us to understand contemporary propositions, 
For example, the proposition, Black Lives Matter, which as Angela Davis explained in a recent panel about prison abolition at the, undergrad at the Underground Museum, should be by now understood as universal. If we regard Piper's art as a model, synthetic proposition, it will become clear how invisible art from 50 years ago is politically instructive today. So the original out in art encounters were conceived with the idea of achieving direct impact. Piper performed them with a goal to elicit reactions that were not going to be determined by viewers' expectations. So some of the work that Alex described um, and a few other works that I'll describe. So if you walk into a museum, you expect art, right? If you're in a supermarket or on the bus and there's this person talking to themselves, you most likely will not think that they're performing an artwork. So by performing out of art's context, Piper aimed to achieve an immediate encounter. So, and of course, we need to acknowledge that our encounters um, and the way that the artwork is resurfacing is within an art framework. So my reception of this is always already as art, not as an immediate encounter. But they live side by side, the initial goal. And, you know, I like these images because you see the people, like you see that person in the slide over there, the, the, one that, the, the woman that's cut off, or you see people reacting to the work in these photographs. So, um, first, this work surfaces as hearsay, as evidenced in a 1971 article by John Perrault for The Village Voice. So, it appears as a description. She has been known to wait in movie lines along Third Avenue wearing vampire fangs, to appear in various bookstores smeared with smelly grease, and to sit in libraries with a concealed tape recording of constant burping. I'm sure any man with male chauvinist pig designs on her would be repulsed as soon as he came within striking distance. Inside the bizarre outer appearance and the conceptual inner workings of these works, do I detect some element of direct protest? So um, Perot was reporting from Lucy Lepard's show titled 26 Contemporary Women Artists at the Aldrich Museum in Connecticut. I don't, I don't have a slide of that show, so this is a slide of another um, uh, Lepard show from the time, just to get you into the period atmosphere. And at the Aldrich Museum, Piper attempted to present Catalysis 8, a recorded talk that would have induced hypno uh, hypnosis in viewers, but which was relocated to New York City because public hypnosis was illegal in Connecticut. So uh, you had a, ph it, it, they actually, um, you could phone a phone number in New York and get hypnotized. Uh, and where she and two other uh, two others performed a piece at the exhibition's opening, wandering around and occasionally sounding tiny harmonicas that they had concealed in their mouths. Since Perot was also describing other catalysis works, not only the ones he witnessed, we get a sense that even this initial appearance of catalysis on record was already cast as rumor. So some of them he's seeing, but some of them he's hearing from other people that are seeing them. Um, in many aspects, the catalysis works echo Mel Ramston's off-sighted remark that, quote, conceptual art was never quite sure where the work was, end quote. Other pieces in this extensive body include catalysis six, in which Piper tied Mickey Mouse balloons filled with helium from her ears, nose, front teeth, and hair, and then walked through Central Park, the lobby of the Plaza Hotel, or rode the subway during rush hour. In Catalysis 7 from 1970, she donned a tight skirt and high heels to visit the Metropolitan Museum, blowing bubble gum and leaving its burst remains stuck to her face. In other Catalysis works, she dug through a ketchup-filled purse for bus change or a comb in the ladies' room at Macy's, coated her hands with rubber cement and browsed at a newspaper stand, rehearsed in her mind Aretha Franklin's respect from beginning to end, and danced silently to it in public space, resolved, resolved disputes with absent antagonists while running errands, and in several variations exaggerated some aspect of interpersonal exchange with strangers. Over the course of the series, Piper wrote and published descriptions of and reflections on the ideas and their various stages, 
commencing with art as catalysis in 1970 and collected after 1973 in a piece called Talking to Myself, the ongoing autobiography of an art object. Like many of her works, part of these texts have been contextualized, sometimes as writing and then sometimes as art. Um, and John Bowles does a really good job of tracing um, this piece of writing and where it, where it shows up and how it unfolds. So what they outline in advance or document after the fact are actions that were mostly implemented privately or unannounced. As she told Lepard in a 1972 interview, Piper was performing the catalysis works for two or three times a week. If the series was made over three years, well, do the math. Um, the vast majority of these works have been carried out without leaving a trace. Still, the works keep, the works keep resurfacing. A postcard sent to the influential curator Harold Zaman at his address in Kunsthalle Bern. This letter apparently reached its destination since I found it in his archive at the Getty Research Institute some 47 years later. It records, two, it records two versions of Catalysis One, the one where Piper soaked her clothes um, in uh, vinegar, eggs, milk, and cod liver oil for a week before wearing them. Um, and you can see in, you know, in the third car of the first D train to pass the Grand Station after 5.15 p.m. on Friday, September 18, 1970, and in Marlborough Bookstore, 8th Street between McDougall Street and 6th Avenue, New York City between 9 and 10 p.m. Saturday, September 19, 1970. Catalysis moved between immediate and unannounced encounters in art contexts to performances in everyday public spaces to one-on-one -on -one encounters with an unsuspecting audience and finally to private performances with only the artist as her own audience, parsing out the limits of what immediate might mean. As Rosemary Meyer described, there is a second version of the Aretha Franklin piece in which the environment is different. The work is performed in Piper's loft in complete solitude. A piece on which Piper is presently working consists of mimicking two sentences her father spoke in a recent conversation of theirs. Piper attempts to think herself into his identity as he was during that conversation and simultaneously to think of herself as the object, the other, uh, to whom he spoke. Piper performs this piece in her loft in front of a mirror while dressing in the morning, while eating alone, and between other solitary activities. So the significance of this work and its broader implications unfolded gradually and over time. Through various types of investigations, several of which enveloped one another. Um, in the ongoing autobiography of an art object, under the heading, Moving from Solipsism to Self-Consciousness, from September 1972, and a subheader titled Recent Work, one finds the following description. So this is straight out of the, book, the 1996 book by MIT Press. So around the time as one and two, which I described earlier, I began a series of six tape-recorded dialogues with a psychologist, Dr. Springarn. The major topics we discussed were my background, history, present occupations, sexuality and love life, friends, family, and so on. Relating all of these to the works I was engaged in at the time. We connected the two areas in terms of motivation, habit patterns, aesthetic intentions, and philosophical presuppositions. Although I refused to perform the works before Dr. Spingarn as a private audience, I described certain works in great detail and spoke at length about my feelings during these performances. At the Adrian Piper Research Archive in Berlin, I found three transcripts of their conversations. So that was a huge surprise. Um, precisely because her work was performed in such proximity to life, Piper sought to make the distinction between what was art and what was not. 
she consulted a psychologist in order to verify that her art was not accidentally substituting for therapy, that it had no function other than an aesthetic investigation. It's a Duchampian distinction, she explained to Spingarn. Yet it was not the imminent or mundane aspects of art that Piper rejected in this art life paradigm. This is in comparison to John Cage, right? Other kind of other genealogies of, of Duchampian um, thinking. But rather the inherent risk of psychologizing the process of art making, clarifying her commitment to absent the expression of subjectivity from the work of art. Subjectivity positioned the artist's perspective and their thinking process, but it was not something she attempted to channel in the work. This was the commitment articulated by Sol Witt in his famous dictum quote, the idea is the machine that makes the art. Probably the most cited like sentence in the history of conceptualism. Here you clearly see the effect of the moment on Piper's work, and this is key. The key given with the work itself made as it was within the conceptual paradigm of the late 1960s. The key for how to read the biography of the artist as the artist positioned it in relationship to the work. This work is not there to tell the story of the artist or to narrate her individuality. Instead, a paradigmatic self is posed as a case study. So for example, when Piper was explaining to Spingarn her, art her artistic the, like the psychologist, her artistic development in the context of her life story, it was to demonstrate how her education as a scholarship student in an elite private school has made her aware of the quote mutually dependent conditions of race and class. She observed how um, how personal difficulties, for example, were so were outcomes of socially imposed circumstances um, and situations. So she's, she's telling him about her personal difficulties, but it's not because she's narrating herself because she's explaining them as um, consequences of, of very particular social outcomes. These realizations combined with reading feminist literature drove her to perform catalysis. And this is, she's explaining all this to him, so that's how I know it. Thus, the above mentioned private performances shed light on how the subject is positioned in the attempt to separate the self into subject and object, treating the self as other, as she explains to Springarn. One of the major things that differentiates my work as art from just any personal ac activity or antic is the fact that when I do it, I become to myself an audience. There is a kind of self-consciousness involved in what I'm doing that creates a kind of inner split between what I am actually involved in and the fact that I'm perceiving myself doing it and when. So there are performances where Piper was thinking about unresolved previous interactions while enacting the resolution of the dispute before an unknowing clerk at the post office window or the supermarket line. This positioned her in three simultaneous states. One, she's a pedestrian shopper. Two, she's rehearsing a scene from her recent past and enacting an extension of that scene. And all the while, she's attempting to register the event by her observing herself as other. She explained to Spingarn the distinction between the philosophical and the psychological outlook of the separation of subject and object. And I'm bringing a lot of these quotes because this work is nowhere in the world, right? It's still in the archive. Now I think that in order to arrive at any kind of philosophical insight, it is quite impossible to divorce psychology from it. I think that when you think about things objectively, you bring everything that you are to bear on the problem. You don't divorce yourself and consider things in purely abstract terms. You involve yourself. You commit yourself to understanding what is going on in virtue of what you are. Kant said something like that, all right? Subject and object are mutually dependent. Um, in this way, although the catalysis works deal with materials drawn from life, they're a philosophical reflection on the relation of art and life, not a psychological collapse of one into the other. The work insists on the subject's imbrication within the work but it is a 1960s self-reflexive subject. 
not the existential or expressive subject of modernism. This is a recognition of how the particularity of a subject's position, who they are on the social matrix, necessarily influence their intellectual point of view. This is not to refute the notion of abstract or universalist analysis in thinking, but rather demonstrate how firstly, there is no position which is neutral, and secondly, how to work with these particularities. Piper, um, Piper is offering a template on how to work from the concrete to the abstract, how to identify what is a case study from which an, a model can be articulated and a universalist idea derived. Spingarn argued that by voiding her subjectivity, Piper was voiding her own humanity. But here's the thing. Piper is not voiding her humanity or her subjectivity. She's voiding her identity momentarily and doing the unity between her experience of self and the intellectual registration of self. She temporarily suspended her identification with, her, with herself in order to use the self as an object in the experiment. When describing her psychological disposition, she mentioned her ability to objectify her feelings and personal situation to, quote, make of them abstract theoretical subjects for discussion, end quote. This abstraction of the particular self is Piper's contribution to conceptual art with capital C, and basically turning it into conceptualism at large. The argument that we abstract from the concrete. Um, in an important essay from 1993, Piper observed how modernism's form from for form's sake was deeply related to the forms that mediate human interaction. Influenced by the self-reflexive character of Solowit's process, where form is generated by a conceptual system, giving primacy to the idea over the medium in which it is realized, Piper narrates her perspective on history. She gives a genealogy, right? So from there, meaning solo wit, from there it was only a short step to conceptual arts insistence in the late 60s on the self-reflexive investigation of concepts and language themselves as primary subject matter uh, of art. And since self-consciousness is a special case of self-reflexivity, it was then an even shorter step to the self-conscious investigation of those very language users and art producers themselves as embedded participants in the social context. So for Joseph Kasud and, and Art and Language Group, this natural progression was from linguistic analysis of the concept of art to discursive Marxist critique of the means of art production. For Hans Hacke, it was from a self-sustaining material from self-sustaining material systems to self-sustaining political systems. In my work, it was from my body as a conceptually and spatio-temporally immediate art object to my person as a gendered and ethnically stereotyped art commodity. It is in this way that Piper's transition from conceptualism to her use of the body as an artwork should be read. It should be read as a transition from, quote, a conceptually and spatio-temporally immediate art object to her person as a gendered and ethnically stereotyped art commodity, end quote. If you start with the person of the artist and then go to the work, well, that negates the historical and the specific chronology by which the work develops and the order by which the philosophical proposition proceeds. So in accordance with this sequence of development, I've been proposing that we need to read Piper's subsequent work in the same order, always first as conceptual, onto which we then can map or apply the political question. To enter the work through its analytic base is to read it on the terms of its making, not by overdetermining the subject position of the artist. The relationship between two works that are in this exhibition can demonstrate this point. So the first work is part of an extended series where Piper used type on a standard eight and a half by 11 inches letter page employing words not solely for the meaning that they convey, but also as a block of typed letters that render a minimal form. A square on a rectangular ground, meant to be viewed in relation to its visual placement on the page. Concrete infinity six inch square 
activated the referential function of words by performing an attempt to exhaust the description of a square rendered by language. The words both form a square visually and describe it textually. The text uses a potentially infinite structure to describe the rendered square. The words read, I guess you can read them. It's in the show. The square should be read as a whole, or these two vertical rectangles should be read from left to right, or right to left, or these two horizontal rectangles should read from top to bottom. The text is cut when it completes the rendition of a six by six inch cube, square. I'm sorry, slip, cube. Um, Piper's analysis of the identity of the square is no different than her later examination of the identity of the self. Philosophically, they raise equivalent questions, asking whether the identity of a thing or a person, for example, lies in its description or in its visual appearance. The work also probes whether reception by the viewer functions simultaneously or sequentially, and which of these modes by which meaning appears may supersede the other. Almost two years later, Concrete Infinity Documentation Piece from 1970 was created as a sequence of diary entries on graph paper where the, uh, where the artist chronicled her daily activities in an exercise limited by specific parameters. Most of the entries were collaged with a picture she took of herself in the mirror. The pages were later framed and hung in a grid, as you can see from the installation shot. And they commence with instructions. So it's the same principle as all the conceptual works. First come the instructions. And you see them on the left. Um, object maintenance. So this can also continues her uh, use of herself as an art object. So object maintenance. Write everything I do, temp and weight on rising and going to bed, picture once a day, no subject, one verb sentence, no incoming information, environmental conditions, sensory input, saw, heard, sense, touch, tasted, eight, okay, read okay, restrict contact whenever possible. Indeed, the visual quality of the handwritten pages affect a sense of the personal, quote unquote. But Concrete Infinity, Do Concrete Infinity documentation piece was neither diaristic nor revealing, but rather the work of conceptual documentation, dry and clinical in its exhaustive description of bodily function a laundry list of so many facts. Juxtaposed with the writing, the photographs act as an additional documentation, proof of, proof of existence, a vehicle to communicate information, not to show the artist in any way. Through the two forms of representation, the piece examines whether the artist can be regarded as an art object. It isolates the idea of the self, quote unquote, from that of an author and or the subject of the piece. So an example of the text reads, got up at 6.45 a.m., peed and shat, turned on radio, weighed 98.5 pounds, body temperature 97 Fahrenheit, made bed. Piper describes daily routines and diet, her yoga practice, whereabouts and activities, or books she was reading that summer. Everything that seemed to be objective with self-referential details, like the descriptions of, descriptions of the works making, uh, the time taken to write the diary entries, or the time taken to take the photograph. Here and there, the context of the art world makes an appearance with mentions of delivering work to the Museum of Modern Art. So she's delivering to her 1970s information show, and that's in there. Um, or social and professional interactions. Oh, I ran into Vito Conchi on my way to the MoMA. Um, in fact, artists from Piper's milieu show up in so many of her works, proving my point that this work has always delivered to its audience the context by which to read it. The photographic part of the work takes um, take up less than less real estate overall underscoring the significance of the written component. These photographs walk the fine line between intimate appeal and a medical record or a social science aesthetic. Small and grainy, these images of the artist reflecting in the mirror, sometimes partially or fully naked, operate as evidence of being, 
not as discrete pictorial objects. They're not nudes as they do not aim to elicit visual pleasure. They're not self-portraits because they do not intend to convey any to the viewer any like deeper essence of the person photographed. Instead, they fulfill the purpose of a record, a means for communication. However, like all other means of mediation, the work foregrounds how photography is never neutral or transparent. On the one hand, we have the attempts of the artist to, to simply point and shoot. On the other, the self-reflexive incorporation of the recording apparatus in the picture, the latter underscored by glare, um, created by the proximity of the author artist object to the mirror. It flares across all of the photographic surfaces, highlighting the presence of the mirror, the object that had bounced the light. It is also the object that fragment, uh, it is also the object that fragments the photographic subject, the photograph subject, into a self as a separate entity from the other who took the image. Um, so here you can see the glare really quickly, really clearly, and it points to the surface of the photographic print as a place of inscription, suspending it between an object to be looked at and a surface to be read. If we can identify an autobiographical or co corporeal impulse, it is evident that it functions through a structural rather than a narrative strategy. Because just as concrete infinity six inch square isolated the two modes of describing a square as text and as image, Concrete Infinity documentation piece isolated the artist as an object from the artist as a subject with an intrinsic sense of self. Clearly this isn't actually possible, right, in, in any full sense, but it nevertheless is an exercise, an artistic investigation that opened up ways to examine distinctions between the ontology of self, identity, and subjectivity and to activate them as items within the work of art as inventory of positions to work with. Subsequently, Piper brought her transition from the body as a conceptually and spatio-temporally immediate art object with its particularity as a gendered and ethnically stereotyped art commodity to bear on the analytic conceptualism of artists such as Joseph Kasuth, Doug Hubler, Larry Weiner, and Bob Berry. I mean, if I sound overly familiar with her names, it's because this list comes directly from her discussion with Dr. Spingarn in 1972. So these are the artists that she's citing. This is the context of her artwork. It is from this moment in time that Piper, as a gendered and ethnically stereotyped art commodity, is always already posing a universal proposition. Thank you. So, I believe we have a bit of time for a discussion here. Yeah. Let's see. Let's let me ask. Do, do you want to start or? No, you can ask. So, um, y interestingly, with the catalysis series, it's, you you say that there are so many more. The numbers were quite astonishing. If yeah. she was doing three a week, however, the numbers themselves are. We only, we only get one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven. In other words, so there are eight that are numbered, but you, s you say there are many more than eight? I, I think she was repeating. I see. So there are many more. Yeah, she was repeating the performances. Um, and then I think there's this kind of ambiguity because if you look at like this, I, when I find these transcripts and I'm like, oh my God, that's what's described in this like tiny paragraph. If you look at the writing, there's all these things that she's describing. So I, I don't know if they're, they're, you know, they're not always named or there's some variations like the ketchup in the purse or um, I don't necessarily know which one that is. Um, so they, they seem to be proliferating. The other thing that I sometimes wonder is there's, there's, there's a lot of works described there and, and it's not necessarily always clear which are catalysis and which are not, but I think they all are everything that's collected in uh, auto, ob, autobiography of an art object, I think are catalysis works. Things are very fluid because like these, she's writing and then the writings appear 
in in like literally in some of the works that you show that works that come in folders where there's like 19 concrete infinity um situation series so some of the writing that's in um the autobiography of an art object literally just shows up on a page as a piece of conceptual artwork yeah i tried to show as many works as i could from that are in on exhibit yeah. so i didn't have the um, luxury to go to her archive and dig up stuff that Amazing. nobody else knows about. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't even know about some of that, the material that's in there. Pre presumably you found things that she was even unaware of. She, for, she forgot. Yeah. I think that this, this was transcribed. Yeah. So uh, I also wanted to ask a question about media, um, or I mean the issue of media, which is... Uh, and I don't mean art media necessarily. I mean mm. anything that mediates between subject and object or between object and object or subject and subject. And you were talking about um, art as, you're going to have to clarify for me, because you were making a distinction between art and immediate encounters. Or how did you phrase it? Yeah, there's an immediate encounter which, by which she means not art. So what, what may, can we spend a bit more time on that distinction okay. between an immediate encounter, and I like the word, fact that media is an immediate. Yeah. Right? So an immediate encounter and art. What is Because I would say that one has an immediate encounter with art. So help me with well, that. Well, I think, I mean, uh, uh, the distinction, and, and maybe it wasn't clear enough, but the, the, the attempt is to distinguish between what she's doing when she doesn't have an audience at all um, and and her, and just to make sure that that's not some kind of way for her to have a psychological resolution to other things, that it is indeed art. So the immediate encounter is the art, the, the, the idea to substitute. Because the difference, the distinction here is that the viewer would not be predisposed to it being art. So if you if you walk into a museum and some someone's behaving oddly, you're like, oh, this is probably a performance, right? But she doesn't want people to assume she's making an artwork. And that's what she calls the immediate encounter. So with a clerk in, in she's performing, but she's just in the post office. So, so no, one's, of, no, one's, no one knows she's making art. Yeah, that's much clearer. I mean, you mean out yeah. of context? Out of context, yeah. Okay. Th that's what she calls the immediate art, like the immediate encounter. With that, that, that the viewer is not predisposed to you know, to, to assuming that they're looking at a performance. I mean, it's an interesting choice of words, if that's what it is. I'd have to follow up on it. The idea that, um, well, anyways. The, the yeah, because I think Context is so important here. I mean, yeah. the concept of context. So to refer to something um, out of context as immediate, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, that's and pretty much it. Speaking yeah. about media, they come back to this notion of uh, the machine, you know, the machine as a medium, I suppose, or as a mechanism, um, the machine making the art. What, what, why do you think that it is that so that she herself turns to that terminology, but so many others have used that um, dictum almost that Solowit develops to crystallize a certain notion of conceptual art? I think that um, they are trying to avoid art making of subjectivity, right? They're trying to, th this is a reaction basically to Jackson Pollock pouring himself on the canvas. So it's, it's an, you know, it's a rem trying to remove the art making from that kind of subjective expression and to, to put something in between. Um, you know, so you're thinking about the idea and then you're putting it down and the idea generates the art. It's not the, the artistic self or the genius that's making the art. Yeah, but you've, I mean, if in, it, you make the argument that um, there is a subjective dimension in coming up with the idea initially, yes, right? In that's other words, true. In other words... Uh, Intuitive, actually, yeah. I, I generally think of intuition as happening once something is going on, when when intuits responses while things are in motion, but there's, you know, the, the initiation of the idea requires a, some kind of... Subject. Of course, I mean that's Rosalind Krauss' sense and sensibility is about the ways in which, like, ultimately the the conceptualists are not able to void themselves of subjectivity because the process of thinking itself, as she says, like they're drawing it from the 
from the insides of their brains. So it's not from the inside of their soul, but nevertheless, there's a kind of figure of the thinking artist drawing something from within. Um, would, so of would course you say it's that impo- about John Cage too? Um, I mean, I, I think, I don't know if she talks about Cage in that article, but I'm, I'm thinking, but Cage, that's, these are all strategies, right, to try and not do the, the, not be the expressionist artist, right? They're all strategies of like, let me find all these ways that I can make art without actually expressing myself. So either the found, like the, the trajectory of, of the Duchampian found object is one kind of strategy. And then this, this machine in the studio is another kind of strategy. Yeah, you see, I've, I'd always understood it. And it does relate to Adrian's work because she works in this manner <laughs> yeah. too. I w- always understood it as uh, the attempt to eliminate uh, the the back and forth. Um, I think it's Barnett Newman or somebody in the '60s talks about the um, the the pursuit of a, a kind of production that doesn't say he's speaking about painting in that in the instance that I'm thinking of um, that makes a mark on the canvas and then steps back, reflects on what has just happened and then goes back to make another mark and steps back and reflects that. Stepping back, I don't know what you would want to call it. Uh, that Because composing temp- is a, a way of expressing subjectivity, right? That's how, where it comes from historically in, in well, modernism. Well, um, in a conversation I once had with Saul Lewitt, he said that he developed his notion of conceptual art from the linear notes of modern music records. Now, modern music, Spoulez, uh, Stockhausen, the, the, the idea was to eliminate, it was to set up a system, yeah. it, which is interesting, right? I mean, you set up a system, then the, com- the composing part, is al- it's already done. I mean, it's, it's composed and then it's carried out. So, so composing isn't the back and forth. I mean, not composing in mid twentieth century. Right, but I'm thinking composing at Kandinsky or or or, um, or uh, Pollock, yeah, or Picasso, like composing the canvas as as an expressive of the interiority of the genius artist. Speaking of composing, we should um, yeah. compose <laughs> from the audience here, so that because I realize we only have ten minutes left in our in our uh, discussion here. So yeah, here they go. The, one of the problems, by the way, is that we can't... I saw a hand go up. It's Simon. The, we're blind <laughs> here. We're blinded. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Thanks both for really interesting talks. Alex, I, wanna, I just want to, by way of anecdote, say that Ivan Reyna was at the video concha piece where he called in, and every time that they announced that, you know, Mr. Akonchi, so where and where, wherever he was, Yvonne didn't know what was happening, and she said, tell Mr. Akonchi to take a cab. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, my question is actually mostly for Nitsan. Okay. So I think there's subjectivity in their subjectivity, and, and I, I think that we, we perhaps run a risk of collapsing subjectivity with certain models of selfhood and certain models of who is Adrian Piper, right? So I'm just thinking that um, in a way between concrete infinity documentation piece, between that moment and um, uh, food for, what is it, food for the spirit, okay? We actually see something that I think is really interesting in terms of your proposition of first comes a concept, you know, and then, you know, you fill in the different kinds of ways of thinking about it. Because what I actually see is a type of coming into her work, a very rigorous rethinking of what is a Kantian subject. In other words, the Kantian subject is not necessarily Adrian Piper, but it is one that she inscribes herself into, that she subscribes to on some level as by ways of making certain propositions. And this is also a type of, uh, a, a mode of address, if you will, you know, which in a way correlates with and very much is sympathetic to um, Solo Wit to you know, the way that she was working before. And I would actually, I mean, I don't have time to go into this, but I would actually say the same about Duchamp, 
there's Duchamp and there's Duchamp, you know. The various models of thinking about Duchamp, one way, for example, is disinterestedness, you know, as one of the ways that he talks about it. That's not my Duchamp, but, you know, let it be. I'm very, I'm very struck by how, um, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for, you know, telling the rest of us who don't go to the archives, right, that there are all, there are all of these different catalysis uh, pieces. And I'm really, really, very, very struck by the way that you talk about how not only there are many of them, but they are variations of repetition. Okay, now what does that mean? Okay, it means that on some level, when you say that she's doing catal you know, catalysis, you know, let's say in sh the shopping piece, that she's a shopper, I think, I, I think it's that she's a shopper, she's repeating a type of speech, a type of scene that she already has rehearsed in her mind. And we see that later on also with Mythic Being, you know, the one about, even though I tell my mother not to, blah, 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 right? So I'm very interested in this idea of repetition, right? Because in a sense, it's a rehearsal. There's a continual rehearsal. There's a continual working, okay? And we call these works. And that actually leads us into thinking about uh, the ethical dimension of Piper's philosophical and artistic output. And by that, I mean the work on the self. Now, so in many of these pieces, she refers to yoga. She documents, you know, exactly what poses that you know, she's done. So I just, I mean, I'm just kind of like proposing this out, th out there because, you know, I want to think a little bit more, more on this. That in some ways, the philosophical pr proposition that I think is, um, in, in a way, uh, since 1970, since 1971, uh, anchored in a type of Kantian proposition is also a form of the ethical, and a, a type of eschesis, if you will. I think, I mean, that's a long question. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I think, and I think Vit is gonna talk about her, her uh, relationship to Kant, right? Uh, but but there is she comes from she uses Kant but she's critical of Kant so so it's always an, an elaboration on a, you know and a, and a it's a critique of idealism and it's a critique of of the idea of the universal by saying you know I'm the universal subject so which is and and in many ways like as I'm reading standing there reading I'm thinking to myself like the 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 missing link here maybe for the audience is that I'm responding to the way that her work was read in the 80s and the 90s. And a lot of the work was read, like there was, there was, uh, you know, she comes out with this, don't call me, don't call me a black woman artist, don't call me, don't call me, because people begin with that and then they move to the work. And then they miss out on the key argument, which is her, who she is on the social matrix is a universal proposition in the way that Black Lives Matter is a universal proposition. So, so and I think that that, the, the key, le, well, the key to that is if you read um, Xenophobia and the Indexical Present, and you want to talk about the, the encounter and the, and the ethical dimension of it, it is about the ways in which you stand across from a person, and, and if you're xenophobic, you don't see them as a person but you see them as a stereotype. And so there's, there's a way in which that translates to the, to the ethics of the encounter. Um, and and is, you know, that's the kind of missing link to what you're asking. There's two different texts, Xenophobia and the Indexical Presence. One is basically a recounting of her work, chronologically. Um, and then another one is like literally an analysis of Kant and how to apply it to these questions of how we read the other, with, when the other is is a is a raced or gendered subject. Can you address the what I see about the ethical? Please wait for the mic. Yeah, you need to take get a mic. <laughs> I I I wanted to just okay. I wanted to come back to this issue of 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 um, repetition though. Yes, a question. And we can give the microphone to the fellow the yeah, gentleman back there. Yeah, uh, repetition. So maybe we'll do this after that question. <laughs> 
or no, maybe, maybe we just won't. Maybe, let me just say go, that. Go for it. Um, the, the issue of repetition and catalysis, I, I think the, the, the move towards rehearsal that you introduce is really productive, but why wouldn't one go to permutation? I mean, these are permutative, yeah. they're permut permutative instances, yeah. permutative, permutative instances. Mm -hmm. Instances of permutation, which is something that she was already working with in, uh, in the late 1960s, coming straight out of the wit, obviously. I, I think you're right. It's permutation, not repetition, because they're different every time. But it's very made. productive yeah. to go to rehearsal, to, you know, to rehearse something else. I mean, a productive idea, anyway. Sorry. No. We'll, I mean, we'll have I to follow up on this. Yeah. Well, I understand also time is is running, right? Time so we are running. kind of yes, like... Yes, it is. I'm sorry. No, I have also a totally different question, so That's I'm really sorry to kind of disrupt it, because I understand the symposium here at the Hammer has been very much composed also by Adrian Piper, and I noticed this morning that everybody's talking in past tense as if she's dead, but she's not dead. I mean, we are right <laughs> now participating Lighting actually up. in an Adrian Piper piece. And I'm wondering. This is an Adrian Piper piece. I think so. I mean, I that's my so. question. <laughs> um, and um, I mean, from what I understand, she actually kind of like put the panelists a kind of approved that. I mean, please correct me if I'm is wrong. Is that true? And your time <laughs> travelers and fellow travelers and global travelers. So where do we traveling? And since we are here right now, I would be really curious about like what are we doing here. <laughs> This is, uh, yeah. you know, I've got Nietzsche, no, Nietzsche on itself. the screen and a question like this. I, I have no idea. I don't know how, how to answer that. It's all yours. I, I mean, it just makes me think of the ways in which things appeared in artworks or as, as pieces of writing and that there is, like, she really is a very interdisciplinary thinker and she brings all these different things to bear on one another. So so part of and from like from the beginning of her practice you can see that her writing about her own practice is part of her practice. So in, in a way to to direct the interpretation of the work, and we had that conversation um, yesterday with Brianne Bradley about um, you know, just in general, like artists that um, like to direct the way that the work is read versus artists that just make the work and leave it in the world. And you know, Adrian has all these like faculties and capacities, and and so I think in this case, like I'm a willing participant in attempting to read her work in in a felicitous way to the way that it was made. And I think that that you know, when you when you have a retrospective, and and things become the kind of definite um, ideas about the work moving forward, then then I completely understand her wanting to kind of um, uh, a curate, for lack of a better term. Yeah. Please wait for the mic. Her, abs her absent presence, yeah, I think. The absence presence, That's. I think that's just straight up political protest, like I'm not coming to the US. <laughs> that's maybe what John Perot was asking in 1970. Do I detect political protest? Yes. The, um, I mean, I mean, to come back to, you, you stunned me when you asked if this was a part of the piece or part, a piece itself. But if art is, if an important element of art is knowledge production, then sure, we can include um, even things that are taking place right now as part of some kind of production within the context of art. Whether or not it's a piece itself is another question. It's part of the logic of like art and language that are very influential on her, right? So this kind of meta, it's very early on that she's writing meta texts and calling them meta texts or make, doing exercises in meta art. So this is maybe like a meta art moment. <laughs> it's also a, <laughs> a seconds to the end moment. Uh, is there one last question? All right, so then we'll break it here. Yeah, so Simon, you. this is to be continued. Into perpetuity, infinity. Thank you. So now we have 15 minutes for a coffee break, and there'll be a chime, and we'd love it if you could all join us back in the theater at 4 o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>